Um, all right, so we want to introduce our first speaker, um, Catherine Minshew. And today we are doing this morning, we're going to have a lot of talk about customers. This is a, a central <laughs> theme of Lean Startup. And so we are going big with customers. But what if you don't have any? You know, that's a real problem. We have this whole idea, like test everything with customers, experiment with your customers. And if you don't have any, what do you do? So please welcome Catherine to talk about that. Perfect. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for having me. Good morning. Uh, my name is Catherine Minshew, and I'm here to talk to you today about uh, a very, very thorny problem that everyone in this room has faced or will face at some point, and that is how do you magically acquire users out of thin air with no money? So most people think about startups like the Field of Dreams, which, if you've seen it, is famous for the tagline, build it and they will come. I wish that were the case in startups, but no. <laughs> In most startups, you can't simply build something and they will come. You have to figure out how do you get the words out to people who don't know you, who don't know anything about you, and convince enough of them to come to your product or your website that you have a large enough user base to be able to test your hypotheses. Now, most of us don't have incredible networks. We may be able to get 10 or 50 or 100 beta testers, but we're not necessarily going to be able to just uh, send a quick email, send a quick tweet, and instantly get the number of people that we need. So I'm going to run you through a few strategies. Um, my background for this is two startups that I've done, and there's a big difference between them. One is dead, and one is not dead. And the biggest difference between dead and not dead in the case of the two companies I've built has been the user bases that we were able to acquire. So the first one, as you can see, we started out with uh, a couple hundred, a couple thousand people. We kept it pretty flat. We were really not able to go beyond uh, a very small group. And we didn't really uh, do very many tests or iterations or have enough people to test hypotheses against different populations. For the second company, we had uh, 20,000 people we were able to reach in the first month, 26,000 in the second, 75,000 in the first. And we were able to keep refining what we were doing and growing uh, and achieve something that I think um, the team is very, very proud of. So what's the difference between these two? I'm going to walk you through the five zero-cost strategies that we stumbled upon for how to acquire users out of thin air and run through them one by one. And at a very high level, these are the five. It's one, design the very first user experience. Two, ask for word of mouth, but make it incredibly, insanely easy for people. Three, seek out like-minded groups as a starting point. Four, know how to approach bloggers and reporters strategically. And five, becoming your own PR machine, which is my personal favorite. So I'll run through them quickly. Um, the first is designing the initial user experience. And this is going to seem like a no-brainer to some of you, um, because you're probably thinking, you know, of course, like when people come to the site, you want to think about what is it that they're landing on, how are they thinking about that. But ultimately, if you don't get this one right, it's really hard to make anything else matter. Because it's not about what people come to your, what people are thinking when they're coming to your site and you know, they're seeing uh, the copy that you've written the first 30 seconds. It's definitely not about what they're thinking in the first three minutes after they've watched a video or a longer story you've put together. It's really about what are they thinking in the first two seconds, that very first impression of your site. Are they thinking, this looks interesting. I kind of get what they're trying to communicate with me. Um, I want to know more. Or are they thinking, I have no idea what's going on here. This looks like something that you know, my friend's kid put together in high school. Because one of the differences between getting people who use your site and find value in it to share it with others, as we're going to talk about, is making it something with a um, sort of a holistic design experience for the first user so that they not only are willing to invest the time in it themselves, but they're essentially putting their neck out when they share it with others and say, uh, I think you should check this out. I'm going to tweet about the site. And you want to think about what is that first user experience. Uh, in the case of my two companies, we had just a couple of design changes that made it both easier to understand what we were doing and also uh, just a little bit more visually beautiful. So people felt like they were sharing something of value to others instead of asking people to take a chance on a site that was, frankly, in the first case, very, very ugly. So secondly, ask for word of mouth and make it insanely easy. I'm sure a lot of you guys, if you're involved in the startup community, get emails from friends. Sometimes they're four or five paragraphs long, and they say, hey, I started this company. This is everything that I've ever thought about it. You know, will you please spread the word? But they're not necessarily very actionable. And they often ask a lot of your time. 
So what do I recommend instead? Uh, what I did when I was launching the Muse is actually put together a very short and concise email to uh, a large group of people that I'd corresponded with in some way. And it had two or three lines about the company. Um, it had a longer description at the bottom if people wanted to read more, but it wasn't something they had to wade through to get to the point. And I wrote out very specific uh, Facebook posts and tweets that I would like to ask them to share. And I said, you know, I would love if you would support me by sharing this on social media. Here are three sample things you could write to do so, so that all people literally had to do was copy and paste. And I promise you the difference in getting people to spread the word about your product, if you give them a copy paste thing they can share on social media, um, is absolutely tremendous versus asking them to think of a tweet or a Facebook post themselves. Thirdly, seek out like-minded groups. Uh, for us, when we started The Muse, this was things like the Stanford Women in Law Group, uh, the Baldwin Scholars of Duke. It was small collections of people that have already self-organized around a purpose that's somewhat related to the one you're trying to serve. So if you're offering of something of value and you're approaching them in a way that is genuine, we often asked for feedback on the product, uh, you'll often hear a very strong response and be able to get initial communities of users. And not only that, but because they're using often trying out or testing your product or site with each other, they may give you more interesting feedback than a single individual trying it out by themselves. Now, fourth, I'm going to spend a little bit more time on, because this is one I think that is often very challenging for early stage founders, and certainly one where I made a ton of mistakes before we found our group with Muse. Um, and it's knowing how and when to approach bloggers and reporters. So obviously, uh, before you even reach out to the first press person, you want to think ahead of time, who is the appropriate person for me to reach out to at this stage? And we've talked a lot about um, yesterday about you know, how, what is it that you're looking for? Do you need 100 beta testers? Do you need 1,000 beta testers? It's often not the necessarily the best way to reach out to Good Morning America, the New York Times, when you're first launching a product, because if it's a true MVP, people are not necessarily going to, you know, the, the wide audience of the world isn't necessarily going to be the right audience for that. So how do you think about the trade bloggers, the people who have, again, those small communities that are relevant to you, and target them appropriately? And once you've targeted them, when you're writing an email, I'm going to go back to keeping it concise, but I think that's a very, very important point. You want to think about telling a story. People love stories. It's so much more interesting than uh, a list of facts or a blast. So I, you know, for us, we found it was really effective to think about um, picking a hero of the story, constructing it so there was a narrative arc. What is the problem that your hero or your product is overcoming? What's the opportunity? And how are you going to be unique? And it's even better if you can relate this to larger trends. So for example, uh, when we were starting a career site for millennials, there was some statistics that had just come out and a larger story around how a lot of millennials with college degrees were working as baristas or were working in jobs where they were you know, educationally overqualified. Pitching a story about your startup linked to a larger trend like that makes it much easier for a reporter who's interested to cover you. I often think of it as how would this reporter make the case to their editor that we're the story they should spend time on this week. And then finally, uh, this also probably goes without saying for some people, but understanding that reporters are humans too. They're often very fascinating ones. They have great backstories and reasons for going into reporting, and their job is to look at the trends happening in their area of interest or in their field and surface the most important stories. And it's really great if your story can be one of those, but sometimes uh, people end up treating reporters like story machines. I don't think that's very fun for anyone. And we found that again and again, reporters who have turned us down uh, because because of the way that we interact with them and the sort of professionalism and courtesy will end up coming back to us or coming back to the story months or even sometimes a year in the future. So my final tip is becoming your own PR machine. And I think this has actually been a secret to a lot of the growth that we were able to achieve and a lot of the users we were able to find, uh, again, on no budget. And what does this mean? It means that out there on the web, there are thousands of blogs, publications, looking for great content and willing to let you talk about your company if you're willing to provide something compelling. So when we started The Muse again, we thought we need to reach an audience of young, urban professionals, millennials, fitting this sort of profile. Where are they and how do we find them? And we approached those sites and offered to write posts for them on topics that would be interesting for their audience in exchange for a backlink, in exchange for being able to use what we were doing as an example in the piece. Um, we started out with very small blogs. We eventually moved to Forbes. And after about a year and a half of the strategy, I started writing for Harvard Business Review, um, Inc., the Wall Street Journal. And what's interesting is we didn't often get it on the first try. In fact, Forbes turned me down three times before they said yes. And Harvard Business 
Business Review ignored my email for about a year and two months uh, until they finally followed up. But I was very, very persistent. Um, I was very polite, and I understood with every single interaction more about what they were looking for as a publication. So those are my five tips. They're not clearly the only ways to acquire users out of thin air, but they are five of the most insanely easy and low cost that I've found. And that gets to the whole heart of this crazy issue, which is that ultimately, to find your users and deliver something of value to them, you need to get really laser focused on who they are, what they want, what's in it for them, and where are they hiding now. And when you go deliver that and encourage them to tell others, those initial 10 users become 100, who become 1,000, who become 10,000, and suddenly you're a whole lot harder to ignore. Thank you very much.